Thank you uh, very much for joining me here, and thank you very much to the organizers for giving me this chance to uh, address an audience which I think is outside of my usual uh, comfort zone. Um, so what I will talk about today is more walks on the quarter plane. So I have, um, it's a blessing and a curse to follow Mireille because she sets up all of the definitions very lovely for you and hopefully now you've understood some of the mechanics of the orbit sum method that will be useful. But on the other hand, I will not be reporting on such a large scale um, beautiful project. Uh, instead, I'm going to go somewhat orthogonal to the talk of, of Charlotte. Uh, and if you're watching online, uh, click here for Charlotte's talk. No. Um, <laughs> uh, uh, in that I will be looking at the, the WAP models that she did not look at, and I will be not looking at uh, the, functional, the functions in between or something at, at such a high level. I really want to get down into the dirt, into the combinatorics. So I'm going to try and fill in the, the combinatorics of the title uh, of this meeting uh, and try to um, try to help you understand why you would study these models uh, if you don't ski, for example. So, uh, so I'll talk on a little bit of a, a bit of a, a little bit of a survey, uh, and then I'm going to sort of finish off with some new work um, that I've done recently with Jason Bell. Okay, so my motivation um, comes uh, from the following. Uh, Combinatorial structures are, are really beautiful and I really love them and I'd like to try to understand how they fit together and understand their relative complexity. Okay? So there's a lot of different ways you could do that. You could ask, uh, what is the computational complexity of recognizing something in your, in your combinatorial class? What is the computational complexity of generating an element in your class? Uh, and I'm gonna concentrate on an enumerative question. That's somehow how we're here. Uh, this may or may not be the right way to do it if you have an incredibly complex family of objects, but there's one of each size. Accounting the number of each size is not going to be so insightful. Um, but I'm going to try to make the argument for you that in general, this is a very good idea. Okay. Oh. So I'm going to find that it's worth it to be explicit uh, in exactly what uh, I would like to do. I'm going to look at the generating uh, functions. So a combinatorial class, so it's a set of objects with some notion of size. And it's going to be important that there is a finite number of any given size. So for example, languages over a finite alphabet. We've seen all these lattice walks. There's always a finite number of a given size. And we move to the realm of analytic series, and we're sort of very lucky as combinatorialists because we have these series with integer coefficients or um, close to integer coefficients, uh, and so it's a very nice universe. And as Marie said in her introduction, often what that means in reality is that we end up with functional equations and we have to find solutions with very particular properties, okay? So why would this um, be a, a meaningful concept? Well, you do have a notion of, it's more than, it, there are, are some really nice correspondences from the combinatorics to the series. Um, you may have, this is quite classic now. So for example, if my combinatorial class is built as a union, a disjoint union of two smaller classes, the generating function is the sum. Okay, that's sort of well known, and Murray was using that um, earlier. If it's a Cartesian product, while well, the generating functions, it's the product. In some cases, in some universes, you could have a marking operator where you're distinguishing certain atomic elements and somehow this roughly corresponds to taking a derivative. And you might start to see how you could build up uh, objects uh, and say things about their generating functions using this. And I'm eventually going to get to differential equations, which is the, our, our wider theme. And if you take this approach, unfortunately, you take a risk of having artificial representations of your differential, rep differential uh, equations, if I were to just restrict myself to this kind of calculus. So I want to do a different approach. Mireille had this same image, and she defined a lot of these classes, so that's very lucky for me. Um, not so lucky for people that didn't see her talk, but um, we have these different 
kinds of functional classes, the rational, algebraic, differentially finite, differentially algebraic. I've inserted uh, another layer in there to be diagonals of rational functions. So this is the subseries extractions that Murray is doing that are somehow taking a Cauchy integral of a, of a rational. These are diagonals of rationals and they form uh, a nice nested uh, correspondence. Uh, and very classically, you have uh, an understanding of what it means uh, when something is rational or algebraic. So what do I mean by that? Already a long time ago in the 60s, people sort of understood that if you have regular languages or languages that can be accepted by a finite automata, it should have a rational generating function. That's a very simple kind of uh, complexity. Next step up, when you have context-free languages or things with a tree structure, these tend to come from algebraic objects or they have algebraic generating functions. And indeed, when you have objects that have an algebraic generating function, the game is generally uh, to find the tree inside of it. So this is a big project with maps, for example. But beyond that, we don't have a great understanding. You have a lot of different objects that fall into these different classes, but we're still missing a nice unifying, ah, it's a different, it's got a definite generating function. That means inside you should find a, uh, but I think we're getting close, okay? So that's um, uh, what, what, why I think there should be, why we should be, classifying things in this manner, in part because there's a lot of evidence for it, okay? So our favorite functions, or the ones that I've been looking at for a long time now, are the definite functions, which we've seen several times now. So they satisfy linear differential equations with polynomial coefficients. They're closed under many combinatorial operations, uh, especially Hadamard product. So Millet gave a, a loose sketch of why, why that might be, um, that non-obvious fact might be true. And it seems to be really at the heart of the very interesting combinatorial classes that have definite generating functions. So typically, if you want to prove something is definite, you'll use the closure properties. And if you want to show something is not definite, you will find uh, in the literature, people tend to do uh, arguments exactly like she did here about problematic singularities, uh, an infinite number of singularities, for example, or uh, when the sub-exponential growth is not rational, okay? So, but is there underlying structure? So these are sort of brought to combinatorialist attention somehow a little bit in the 1980s by Richard Stanley, who said, ah, you should pay attention to this class because it has a lot of combinatorial properties of correspondences. And the first question, of course, was, well, which object, can we find examples of things, non-trivial classes that have definite generating functions? And I showed you some examples already, like the standard Young tableau or K regular graphs. These sort of came out within 10 years. Uh, then you saw some people trying to build, as I suggested, using this marking operator, trying to build a notion of what it could mean to be definite. Um, but I think that was not so insightful. And so you come to um, the project that I had with Millet, where he said, okay, let's work inside a universe, a nice universe that we can sort of master and try to understand what goes where. So she showed her these, these lovely classification theorems and it's not, it, um, you might ask why would you, why is that so interesting? It's because we're really trying to understand what is the structure? Is there an underlying structure to things that have definite generating functions or is it just a fact that happens randomly? Okay, so should we be hopeful? I'm always hopeful, um, but uh, you have a, a nice quote already uh, in, in this paper of Flagellet, Gerhold and Salvi. Uh, almost anything is non-holonomic unless, unless it is holonomic by design. Holonomic in the case of generating series coincides with definite, so it is talking about the same thing. So uh, I don't want to say just because Philippe Flagellet said there should be structure, we should be motivated, but a little bit. Uh, and of course at the end, um, with these new classes that um, this group has found, we should be asking ourselves the same question about differential algebraic. Okay. Is it, is it a design issue or is it, a, is it um, by accident? Okay, so Millet gave a nice survey of what we did in the quarter planes and now I really want to go in and like I said, take the orthogonal approach and really try to understand why. Not just from a, a, 
uh, oh, this satisfies this particular kind of, the asymptotics satisfy a particular form or not. Why are certain things definite or not? And this is a big question. Uh, and the scope is uh, to make it more palatable or reasonable, I'm going to close my vision a little bit. And I'm going to concentrate on excursions okay, from two different universes. So she already, uh, Mireille introduced the notion of excursion. So these are going to be walks that start and end in prescribed locations, typically the origin, but not, not necessarily. And so I'll look, review some of the things that have come across, uh, come about in our lattice path study about excursions that might lead us to where to look for structure uh, or combinatorial understandings, even though that's a rather vague term, of why things are definite or not. And the second part, I'm going to really lean on uh, in a universe where we have so much information that is anything you could know about groups to say, OK, what if we look at excursions uh, in some sense on groups? Uh, what is there new insights that we could take uh, or try to understand? OK, so those are the two parts of what I'm going to do today. OK. Uh, OK. Lattice paths, part one. So Marie did, I could not do it uh, better than her, but I'll summarize again. Uh, given a set of steps. So what is a set of steps anyways? It is a set of vectors, a set of directions. It could be compass directions if you're working in a small enough universe, or when you're doing big enough steps, you should actually specify the vectors. You fix some cone, quarter plane works quite well, but you might, we'll, we'll vary that in a moment. Uh, and you're interested in walks so sequences of these steps, which remain uh, in your cone. So start at the origin. Maybe they end anywhere. Maybe they end, uh, again, at the origin. Uh, you're interested in these counting sequences. So the question we asked is, in this universe, which is quite uh, contained, can we determine the nature of the generating functions, uh, or the nature of these sequences uh, via their generating functions? Okay. So that is the universe. But like I said, Mireille did a, a great job of explaining that. She also uh, reminded you or introduced you to the small step walks in the quarter plane where you say, OK, let's, let's shrink the universe even more. Let's say we only want these small steps. Uh, and we're going to fix the, let's see, does this, uh, oops, where is the, oh, there we are. Um, uh, fix the quarter plane, take some subset of these walks, and see what happens. Can we classify the generating functions? Uh, I don't think we would have expected differential Galois theory to come in when we started looking at it. Uh, I don't think I knew what that was even. So uh, it has been really a remarkable multidiscipline effort. You see computer algebra, you see um, all sorts of different techniques, analysis, probability that have come in to sort of work on this classification. Uh, and I think um, it's been very fruitful. So as she said, here we have what a, a possible decomposition could look like for what the functional equation looks like. I think in this case, in part, it's very nice. And perhaps this is also um, illustrated in what, uh, after Murray's talk, is that the fact that you can decouple it or reduce a walk that ends anywhere to something that ends on the plane or the excursions, uh, I think that is quite a special property. And that's why we got uh, very lucky here. So here are the 79 models. And I do, uh, there is one repeated uh, in this one. So I found it too late to change it. But here they are. Here they are before your eyes. So if you start to, you know, you can take a look at this now, commit it to memory, and see if you can figure out what the patterns should be that would give you um, a different kind of uh, one classification or another. So for example, in a lot of the definite models, you will find that they are symmetric across an axis. And Murray proved that early on, saying that if you're in that case, you will be definite. So that is an example of a combinatorial structure that led to an analytic property. Um, these ones down here are the, the genus zero case of, that Charlotte mentioned. And we showed that those were, I, I showed those, um, were not definite because they had, they somehow were accumulating singularities. And this was a case where actually we had an infinite group and we did exactly what she suggested. We iterated our functional equations and showed that we were accumulating singularities. So again, I feel like I could have a, a bit of a combinatorial gut feeling about why these things are not definite. 
But why these ones are special, I can stare at them and I'm not quite sure. So maybe you can stare at them and say, ah, yes, but clearly. Um, and same thing here, what makes these uh, less suitable, who knows? Some of them have a nice symmetry across X, Y axis. They look kind of cute, these little scarecrows, I guess is what they're called. Oh, and again, it's repeated. Yeah, right here. Oh, it's so tough from the way I'm doing I generated them in ticks and it's really the wrong way to do it. <laughs> um, but you have some very nice models and it's really not uh, clear what, from when you list it out like this, why, why there's any correspondence or correlation uh, at all. So this leads to, to why I would wanna talk about this to a group like you is uh, sometimes there are strange insights that you can get when you actually pull, go through the different functional equations. So what um, discuss perhaps at lunch, for example, uh, how can we complete the classification for the univariate counting series? This came up in Charlotte's talk that we can say we're in one of these categories for the multivariate generating function, but if we actually want just to know the univariate generating function for walks of length n, actually it's not complete. There are um, some models in here that we actually anything below anything in here, we don't necessarily know for sure that they're not definite and the counting generating function. That's not entirely true. There are some models in here which we do know, but a, a lot of them, I would say most of them, we do not. So actually, this classification is for the multivariate generating function, but of course, if you specialize, you might get yourself into a nice case and this might no longer hold, okay? There's other questions of some of these models. I said if you're an algebraic function, there's a tree in there somewhere. Well, this Gessel model, this first one here, uh, I think it's very difficult to find the tree. <laughs> so it has a very large um, algebraic equation that it satisfies, and there's no obvious tree uh, to be found, uh, no obvious tree. So can we actually say, well, if we want to adhere to this combinatorial structure, we should somehow Let's try and see if we can find a tree structure in there somehow, and I'll come back to that. Um, a lot of this would be made simpler if we could understand the combinatorial implications of a finite group. So the group I'm not going to define, Marie did define, discuss it in, in her talk, and that was very key to the classification. So if somehow you could make a direct link to combinatorial properties, then a lot of this would be resolved, okay? Uh, I would also love to have more explicit formulas for generating functions. So in a lot of these cases, and we will see them in a little bit, uh, they're hypergeometric functions, they're integrals of hypergeometric functions, they're, they're algebraic functions, and we, it can be very explicit, but once we've come out of this realm, uh, I, there's no explicit functions. So what, what are they? Um, and I'm gonna talk a little bit about what, where I think you might be able to look. Um, but some of these nice symmetric models, the functional equations, as she said, the functional equation always works. Can you start from that and actually see what the series is and understand um, what it looks like? Is it some sort of deformation of a hypergeometric function? Is it something, something that we don't know? Um, that's what I'd like to know about. Uh, I would like the differential equations. I asked Michael Singer, I said, do you have uh, the differential equations? And he said, what would you do with it? <laughs> like, just collect it for now. But uh, I think maybe we can try to find, um, see, again, again, dig through the differential equations to see uh, if we can see anything at that level, even if we can't solve them. Uh, uh, yeah, and so what are the nature of these uh, non-ADE generating functions? So that's, there you go, if you need uh, something to talk about at lunch, um, <laughs> you can consider that. Um, okay, so what I'm gonna do to actually facilitate this discussion uh, is consider uh, two different simplifications. One, I'm going to say, okay, actually, let's not look at all the walks, let's just look at these, what's called the simple walks, north, east, south, west, uh, and vary the cone, and see what we come up with with that. Uh, and then I'm gonna look just at the excursions to say, well, excursions are a little bit easier as we've mentioned already, or Marie mentioned, you have really uh, some high powered work of Denisov and Vachtel, which has been translated to our context uh, by uh, several authors now. Um, so what, if, what can we learn just by looking at the excursions? Is there something that we can get from there? So that's what I'm going to do next. 
Okay, so here's a simple model and here is a bunch of different cones. So now I'm varying the cones. And um, I could look at the half plane and this is rather classic that the simple model of walks it in anywhere. This would be algebraic. And these models here, well this is just the quarter plane model. Um, but these ones here, I mean these are also quarter plane models. Murray showed you that you can just take these sort of algebraic, linear algebra deformations and recover these. So we know these answers and they've been studied in the literature, um, oh, going back even uh, to the 80s and earlier. Uh, we could make our cone go almost all the way around and avoid the slip plane and Millet uh, in two papers, one on her own and one with Jill Schaefer, studied the slip plane and showed that it was uh, actually an algebraic model. More recently you have this three quarter model which Millet has uh, uh, a nice study of, and uh, Killian and Amelie will have one uh, shortly as well. Um, so this seems kind of promising, and if you look, there's a little bit of a theme that's going on. All of my boundaries are somehow, uh, they're, they, they're multiples of pi over four, okay? So Timothy Budd has a nice paper as well where he tries to treat this rather systematically. It, uh, in the case of excursions, and he even has some conditions for algebraicity in his paper, in the case of excursions, okay? So this says that maybe this is the good, the good subset to look at. Um, on the other hand, if we were to take an arbitrary angle, uh, as Mireille said, that you have some results already where you can get the sub-exponential growth, and you can sort it between, uh, if it's not, and they have, sorry, it is a relatively simple function of the angle, uh, and so you can at least exclude a lot of cones saying, no, 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 that's never going to work. So for me, I find this picture a little bit more easier to understand, saying that, okay, if I'm actually a walk in a really nice cone, uh, I should expect nice things to happen. Um, what I would like to say is that really that's it. If we could show that, that that's it, that would, uh, I think that would be quite, quite satisfying. So this is uh, something, for example, that uh, a student, Sam, is, is looking at, okay? So that's, that's kind of what I mean by, I, that feels combinatorial to me at, at a combinatorial uh, understanding. So now I'm gonna focus on excursions, okay? So they start and end in the same position, okay? They, the generating function for excursions is an evaluation of this multivariable general generating function at zero, zero, as Murray explained. In some cases, when you have a negative diagonal step, it will appear in your functional equation. So your final answer will be written in terms of the excursion generating function, okay? And here, the asymptotic formulas are more accessible. In the two-day case, well, they're more accessible, but they're not, it's still, it's still very tricky. In two-dimensional case, they were translated by Aline uh, Killian and Bruno Salvi. And they were used, and many excursions were shown not to be definite because they had an incompatible sub-exponential growth, as we've discussed. Um, in some cases, you can further imply that the counting generating function is not uh, definite, very roughly, but not exactly, when the drift is very negative, okay? And the 3D cases, this is, this is uh, very recent work where they say, okay, now let's look in three dimensions and excursions, and they found some really nice characterizations of what it means, uh, uh, um, uh, what these formulas uh, can mean. Okay. okay, so I, again, that's nice, but I really want to get into pictures and do picture proofs, which some people uh, find either intimidating or unsatisfying, but that's how I like to see things. So where could another source of sort of a combinatorial regularity come from if I'm looking at excursions? So I'm gonna tell you a little bit about reflectable walks. So uh, in the, the starting point that was most accessible to me is the article of Gessel and Zalberger in 92, where they look at excursions uh, in these sort of finite reflection groups in these vial chambers. So you have quite an algebraic setup. You have a nice universe, for example, your in two dimensions, you're somehow tiling your plane. And their argument is dead simple, saying that, okay, 
let's say you are not working in the quarter plane or in the regular uh, grid. Let's say you're working on uh, looking in some other kind of lattice and you have steps that you're taking on this lattice and they have a few conditions. The steps, uh, the lattice is somehow generated from the steps, so that actually makes sense. Um, that you have a reflection symmetry, so your, your regions are defined by hyperplanes, so your step set has to have a reflection symmetry across the hyperplanes, much like those definite models earlier on. And you cannot jump a boundary. So I could not have a step set with such a big step uh, as Mireille because I would have to uh, I'd have to jump a boundary and that would be excluded from their universe, okay? So the idea is to count walks that start and end uh, at prescribed points um, in a very natural way. So here is a little schematic. Imagine I've got a walk, uh, an unconstrained walk, a walk that can go anywhere in my plane. Starts off where I'm interested in, but maybe it wanders off. So their idea, which is, um, I mean, it's based on reflectable, reflection principle from, from much, much earlier, but applied here, saying, okay, at some point, if you touch the boundary, flip that, okay, and then continue on your way. So here, from this walk to this walk, this starts in here, does this crazy stuff, crosses the boundary and continues on. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna say, ah, this has a buddy. This buddy uh, flips is the mirror, and I know that's an acceptable walk because my step set is reflectable. I walk along in here till I hit the boundary, and then I continue exactly as it did before. So these two walks will end at the same point, but they start in different chambers. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna assign signs, much like we did in the orbit sum somehow, uh, and say, okay, um, let's pair these up. Let's give this a positive, let's give this a negative. We can do this systematically by assigning it uh, around in the chambers. Um, and then if I take a sum of all of the walks that start at here, 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 some sort of signed sum and end anywhere, these two are gonna cancel each other out. And the only ones that are gonna survive are the ones that stay in their own, that never touch a boundary. Okay, so only walks that never touch a boundary are gonna remain in that sign sum. So then to get the generating function for these walks, uh, I'm gonna be interested in the, the, only, the only the terms of the walks that remained in this boundary are gonna remain and I just have to extract it by its endpoint. So if I want a walk that's gonna end, for example, start and end here, I just look for that monomial in my rational function and I extract it out. If I, so that's, um, it's done by an extraction, okay? So again, this is really a more, an easier version or another analog of the orbit sum method because you're, you're doing these sort of matching things up, things are canceling out, and at the end, you do this extraction. And at the end, you have that these will always be definite because you're always doing a subseries extraction from a rational, okay? So again, I find that very, I can understand that and I'm happy with that. I'd say, okay, our, our reflectable walks, sort of how the driver behind all of the definite walks, not, not entirely, but you do capture some additional models, um, again, by working in some file group and then uh, deforming it to get to your quarter plane. Okay, so let's just say another little few things about these subseries extractions. So, uh, for most, yeah, we saw this already. Mary outlined this perfectly, saying you have your orbit sum and then you do the subseries extraction that tells you automatically that it's definite. Uh, and here's another, here's a different model, but the same sort of thing. I use her conventions where X bar means one over X and Y bar means one, one over Y. And I do this kind of thing. I want all the positive terms, okay, on this. That, this, is, this was her, her last step, Mary's step four, okay? So doing that extraction is, is difficult. So what if we do something else instead? What if we're just interested in the asymptotics? So what if I just wanna know an asymptotic formula for the number of walks, um, uh, for example, that end anywhere, can I get it from this, okay? So this is again, when you run into the realm of people that are good at functional equations, they know answers to these things sometimes. Um, in combinatorics, we're interested in this analytic combina no, analytic combinatorics of several variables. There's a book of P. Mantle and Wilson, and they tell you, okay, not so much, 
it has to be put in a slightly different form, but if you want to find the asymptotic number, the coefficient of t to the n, for example, you're going to play with this rational function. Okay? And you're going to play with it in a particular way that I find to be insightful. Okay? So what you're going to do is you're going to look at the surfaces described by the kernel, this variety here, and uh, also if I want to get all of the walks, I will look at one, uh, one minus x and one minus y, and I'll have three competing surfaces, and they're all trying to tell me uh, where the asymptotics should go. So I have to analyze these different surfaces and look at the different points on them to try to, to say something reasonable about the asymptotics. Okay? So I'm going to be a little bit more specific in a moment, um, but the idea is that even if I can't do that extraction, I might be able to do other things. I might be able to do other insightful things. Okay? So another benefit of this um, orbit sum that Murray described is that if we want to do certain weights, actually we can do this. We can keep track of a lot of different things. A lot of things will pull through those group actions. Uh, I don't know if that's, I assume that should also be true in, in your, your bigger step models, but maybe that's to be, to be studied. So let's say we do this. I'm going to try and explain to you what I mean so I can go back to, again, justifying why I think excursions are going to tell you a lot about what you need to know. Okay? So I'm going to consider a weighted model. So this is a particular walk in the quarter plane, and I'm going to put weights on it, and they seem like they're very particular. Um, that's, they're sort of scaled in a nice way. They're central weights. The, the key thing is that if I get to, if I have sort of a multiplicative, um, I'm multiplying weights of my steps to give me the weight of my walk. I want two walks that end at the same point to have the same weight, so I have to have this sort of structure. Um, but I can put the weights through that orbit sum computation to, and then put that through that analytic combinatorics machinery and actually come up with some asymptotic formulas where I've kept the A and B, the weights. Okay? So this was work with Julien Cortiel, Stephen Meltzer, and Killian. Uh, where we looked at this model in particular, only this model, and then we tried to be explicit as we could for the weighted model. Okay? So, okay, great. What, what, what is so interesting about that? So let me be more clear about what I'm saying. You fix a number A and a fix a number B. Probably, I mean, they don't have to be, you don't have to make probabilities. You couldn't anyways. I mean, you'd have to rescale it to make probabilities, but let's say you put some values on, and then you have a new model, and then it goes in the, uh, uh, you look at uh, the generating function. What can you say about um, somehow the asymptotic behavior? Okay? And what's really nice is that you have different regimes for the sub-exponential growth. Okay? This does not depend, this depends on A and B, but not in any sort of continuous way. So you're not going to somehow accidentally fall out or disqualify yourself from definiteness by asymptotics uh, through this here. And then for the exponential growth, uh, here we have these formulas which sort of deform one into the other uh, very nicely, but I want to concentrate on the sub-exponential growth. Okay? Because there's a better way to write it. And this I found surprising. Okay, so I have, if I have a model, we've heard that the drift is somehow important. Yes, it is. What is the drift? I'm going to take the sum in that direction and the sum in this direction. I'm going to get a vector. Uh, no, sorry, the sum in that direction minus the sum in this direction. The sum of the weights going up minus the sum going down, and I'm going to get a vector or a point. So I've got this diagram here. So if I pick an A, I pick a B. For example, if A and B are one, then my total drift or my point is zero. So I go onto my little reference diagram. Okay, this is going to tell me what the sub-exponential growth is. So if I pick an A and a B that's going to put me in this region here, I'm going to have a sub-exponential growth of n to the zero. If I pick some, for example, imagine I make B really, really large uh, and A really small, I could end up somewhere over here, and my sub-exponential growth is going to grow like n to the minus fifth. Okay, so what's kind of neat about this is that I have these different regions separated by lines. It's actually, uh, it's quite nice. There's more to say about it, about the, the connection between this cone here and the cone that made this a simple walk. That's something else you could say. But what is very interesting is that in this region here, I'm behaving like an excursion. 
Okay, so if I really want to understand something about my walk, well, maybe what I could do is put weights on it, make it behave like an excursion, and then go back to my understanding of excursions. Yes, sir. Oh, yes, ma'am. Sorry. <laughs> Oh, the asymptotic, um, the asymptotic uh, growth looks like the excursions for that model. For the unweighted. For the unweighted model. That's true. Yes, for the unweighted model. Yeah, that's a good precision. Okay, uh, and that you would have this. So what this is sort of telling you is, I, as I put my weights on this, those three surfaces that I told you that are competing for my, my attention for the asymptotic growth, they're changing and different ones are becoming more prominent. So when I'm in here, I'm behaving like a walk uh, that's almost a free walk. And when I'm in here, I'm behaving like a walk that goes back to one of the axes. And when I behave and here, uh, I'm behaving like an excursion. So I really can see the behavior um, uh, of, the un, of the unweighted walk, uh, it's, it's somehow coming out in here. And this somehow matched, I don't know if you finally proved it, Kilian, but that, that a function would have this behavior that you could build these sort of diagrams um, for non-definite models or any models is somehow uh, a conjecture. But their conjecture, I think, well supported. Okay. Okay, so again, I want to go back to pictures, so let's go back to pictures. Uh, Timothy Budd has really some nice work on excursions, as I've mentioned already. Um, in some of his early approaches, what he was doing was actually making a, a, a bijection from excursions uh, in these different cones to maps, which are then decorated by further excursions. So I got quite excited about this because I'm like, aha, somehow there's a, you can find this, this Gessel model in here somewhere, and then you also have maps, but they're sort of decorated in complicated ways. So I'm actually kind of optimistic that this work here could help us understand another picture. So if I have maps and trees decorated with algebraic objects uh, in a nice way, what kind of class of um, definite functions or what kind, of, what kind of objects would that arise? Last connection or last motivation for setting excursions. Okay, here you have a, a nice simple bijection. So this is an excursion. I can go up and down and I start and end on the axis. What I'm gonna do is every time I dip down, I'm gonna actually flip it up and remember where I flipped it up. So actually this, I'm going backwards here. So I'm, I'm flipping up this one here. Uh, I'm flipping up this one here and I'm flipping up another one here. So to go from here to here is quite straightforward. To go from here to here, what I'm gonna do is every time I have a little purple leg, I'm gonna flip it up. So now I'm not ending at the axis, I'm ending up in the air, okay? So this is somehow a, a classical bijection between uh, dick prefixes uh, and these up-down walks, uh, what are they, bridges perhaps, uh, which end on the axis. So this is an excursion, this is a walk that ends on an axis, and this is rather classical. So uh, in a paper with Julien Cortier, Eric Fusi, and Mathias Lepoutre, we show that these two sets were in bijection with an explicit bijection, okay? So vial chambers in some uh, dimension uh, K, walks that end on an axis, and then we double the size of the vial chamber and we have excursions. So again, if you can understand your excursions for some cone, maybe you can understand the excursions for half of the, if you understand the axis, ah, set it backwards. If you can understand the excursions in some cone, maybe you can understand the axis walks in a bigger cone, and then once you have the walks that return to an axis, uh, this is often enough to get you all of the walks. So again, this is mostly, I'm trying to say that maybe excursions are a good place to start to look if you want to actually understand uh, the combinatorics, okay? so. Now I'm gonna take a slightly different approach, but it starts off a little bit the same, because uh, I feel like I need some new tools. I need some new tools in my toolkit, some new understandings. So I think I'm gonna get something from here. So what are Cayley graphs, and what are excursions and Cayley graphs? So imagine you have a group, and some sort of a finitely generated group, and a generating set for your, and, uh, a generating set for your group. 
So the vertices of your Cayley graph are going to be elements of your group, and you have edges if you can sort of multiply you sort of your neighbors, you take elements of your generating set, and you multiply around. Okay? So we need to count something in here. What are we going to count? Excursions. We're going to go from the identity to the identity. Okay? So another way to phrase this is that these are the number of words in the language of your generating, or the, uh, the words on your generating set that actually reduce to the identity. Okay? So this is the word problem. This is a very long, this is a, this is a, this is a, a people have been looking at this for a very long time. And my, I, my goal today is not to be comprehensive by any means. I just want to show you some, some different, um, different approaches that are going to lead to, to a similar hierarchy and try to understand, well, what can we pull in here? And is there any, are any of our walks that we're looking at, are they actually coming from something like this? Okay. So the question, of course, is the same. If I give me a group and a generating set, what is the nature of the sequence? Uh, and does it carry meaningful information about the group? Okay, so just to make sure we're on the same page. Remember, this is the number of words that reduce to the identity. So let me take a free group, and my generating set, uh, let it be the uh, x and the, uh, its inverse, which I've denoted here by x bar. So the Cayley graph, I'm just, I can go somehow either way. So this one is labeled 1, x, x squared. OK, so it's just the line. Uh, which words can go to the identity? Well, I can go left and I can go right. So it's just excursions on this one-dimensional graph. OK, so we can figure out how many there are uh, rather easily. If I want to, I can make, uh, have two variables to help make them commute to do the same thing. I'm going to get a grid. Uh, and this is going to be simple excursions in the full plane. And now with what we were looking at with the cones, maybe we can uh, ask further restrictions on the group elements, saying like, okay, I want a word that reduces to the identity, but always uses more x's than x, x inverses, more y's and y's inverses. Suddenly, those are excursions in the quarter plane. Okay? So what's really nice is that for, this is, this is uh, again, rather historical, and there's, there's a lot of names here, so I'm not, I'm not, I'm giving you a flavor, I'm not um, being so pedagogical here, but if I look at the language of words that reduce the identity, okay, look at this. This language, so this is a bunch of symbols, it's generating your group, this is regular if and only if the group is finite. So basically you're going to have a finite automata, accepting, uh, whether, figuring out whether or not you are the identity. This language is context-free if and only if G has a finite index-free subgroup. So that's a condition on the group that makes it context-free. So in the computational complexity hierarchy, you can sort of go on, and indeed people have, to talk about rec recursively enumerable. Um, and then it's context-sensitive that is still open. But from our point of view, from the generating function point of view, this means that we have the first two layers. If the group is finite, that the core growth series, or the core growth series generating function, rather, is rational. And in that second condition, it's going to be algebraic. And so, of course, it's a natural question to ask, when is it definite? When is it algebraically? When is, there, um, uh, when is it ADE? So in this universe, uh, you have some, lots of examples and some general theory even. Uh, again, I would point you to um, some surveys of Igor Pak, for example, uh, if you wanted to actually uh, see more about it. So what am I going to talk to you about today is saying that, aha, uh, a non-definiteness criterion, and I'm going to build some functional equations, and I want to so try to understand um, how this meshes with my universe, my usual universe. Okay? So this is stuff, this is the stuff that I did with, with Jason. OK, so if I have free products of free and finite groups, I'll give you an example in a second. Uh, again, I don't necessarily want you to get into this, but the point is that we give, uh, these are going to be algebraic, and you can find an explicit system. Okay? This potentially could be a very big system, but you can have some reduction. So what is this system? What am I actually building here? This F, G, X, so G is a group element. X is a subset um, of the group. Uh, I'm sorry, I have a bunch of groups that I'm taking products of. I'm taking free products of, of groups. Uh, uh, and these are going to be the words that you avoid when you're trying to generate G. Okay? So I, 
more importantly than the details, because I certainly would not want to go through this, is the, fa the fact that I have this nice system and that if I want to get the co-growth series, I'm just looking for this. So this is going to be dependent on some other things. Uh, it's going to build an entire system, but it's very explicit. Okay? So what I would appeal to people here is that it's explicit, though I do have trouble actually <laughs> solving it and reducing it. So um, right now I've just been using Maple Eliminate and I feel that there should be better ways. So, <laughs> but nonetheless, this is, a, this is an example here. So this is um, a cyclic group of order two and for example, a cyclic group of order n and I take some free products. Here is an example of the Cayley graph when n is equal to three. So I can have I have some cubes and I have some squares and I, I start at the identity and I want to walk along here uh, until I come back to here, okay? That is what I'm trying to count. That's the excursion I'm interested in. Um, here is my generating set and an explicit presentation. So what we were able to do is use that grammar there essentially to find uh, a functional equation to solve. Uh, and actually what we did is we found the, the, this for a variety of n, and then actually we guess the general form. As you can see, the general form, the n's are really quite explicit. So this was, this was quite nice, okay? So in a lot of these cases, we can generate these, um, these, uh, these series. Uh, from what we noticed, some, there was some work done previously for some small n. There's definitely some work done uh, for, for, um, by Kuksoff when you, when you don't allow yourself to, to go back from the way you came on the graph. So that was done rather explicitly. But for n greater than four, I, I had not seen an actual uh, equation for this. Okay? So we did a lot of these kind of examples. Oh, there's some other. <laughs> I, I, yeah, <laughs> so there's some examples <laughs> of what the graphs look like. Uh, we did some examples and then uh, we're able to show that um, in fact, if you have a finitely generated group with symmetric generating set, oh, the little row disappeared. This quantity here is, if that's the radius of convergence of the Crow growth series, then actually we have showed this gap theorem that you sort of take a break for a little bit and that not all of them are possible. So this was done by reducing a lot of groups to these smaller cases that we could work out explicitly algebraically. Um, and uh, I don't think I've seen this kind of theorem with respect to, to walk models, so I feel like it's a little bit of a different universe, but, um, but it did give me some ideas on how to reduce things combinatorially. Okay, uh, something else that we have is, um, I'm, not gonna I'm not gonna describe the, this, what this, this means, but I want to emphasize that I have some sort of criteria, a finitely generated amenable group that is not nilpotent by finite, okay. Um, then its co-growth series is not definite, okay. So the proof uses Keston's criterion on growth of amenable groups, which again is out of the scope of, I want to say my knowledge, but uh, also this talk. Um, and then we could show, again, this argument that you had an incompatible singularity structure, which I do want to talk about because it's general. So imagine you have a radius of convergence of your series, and all of the derivatives are also absolutely convergent on that disk, then your function cannot be definite, okay? In part, we just use the structure of what, it, what a, G, uh, a G function has to look like and say that if you eventually take a derivative, you're gonna get either a pole or, or just gonna get some nasty things in the denominator, so it does have to explode eventually. But I think this could be useful in a few different contexts, um, so I did want to present it. I'm not sure if this excludes it from being uh, uh, ADE though, okay? And I'll just mention that, that this was originally conjectured by Garibrandt and Pack. Marissa, yes. What was your bound? What was? What your bound in the previous slide? What? The interval range. Yeah. And uh, I think Jason suggested that there is another gap later on. I'm not sure. Yeah. Yes. Disk, where is the center of your disk? Oh, oh, sorry, sorry, sorry. Uh, uh, of, uh, I have confusion on the, because, oh, it should be, um, I've, I've messed up my variables. Is this your, your concern? This should be a Z here, Z, Z, or an X here? Well, I expect a, a center at the radius, and I, and I see. So centered at the origin. Uh -huh. Yeah, sorry, I did not say that right. Okay. 
Um, yeah, so I don't know what other things this could exclude, and I don't know what we have. I mean, you do have examples of these groups, so my next stage is to actually look at some of these series to see if I understand what they are at all. Okay, so I'll close thoughts now. Uh, I'm trying, well, I, I'm interested in groups and I wanted to explain that to you because you have some really nice work on that coming out now, especially, for example, from the Melbourne School and its, and its children, um, to try to understand either definite in a new way, in a new context, in a new universe, uh, or to say, okay, these are all the tools we have for definiteness. There are a lot of different, um, there are some things you can exclude in the group theoretic world, knowing that the co-growth series is definite or not definite. So paying it forward, I guess, I'm not sure. Um, uh, I don't know if this, I, I think this is much too ambitious and not accurate about reflectable models. I think they're really playing a core of what's going on. If I look at um, the different uh, definite classes I mentioned at the beginning, like standard Young tableau of bounded height, Baxter permutations, for example, those have bijections to lattice path models, nice lattice path models. So the, the objects that you occur in nature, not just in your little lattice path laboratory, they do seem to have becoming a little bit from reflectable models. I guess Murray had some, I'm not sure if they would be counter examples or not with the uh, models you had from the bipolar orientations. I'm not sure if those, large steps, so yeah, no, but can, right. But to what extent there is a, a reflection symmetry at play, uh, uh, that's um, what I'm not sure about. Um, uh, I would like to have more tools to try to say what can you get from excursions. Uh, in particular, what can you say about the univariate counting uh, series? And what are there other good universes to explore where there's natural things where I can generate things in the same way, generate series and play with them and try to understand um, the structure uh, of objects that have definite generating functions. So that's it. Thank you. Uh, about uh, algebraic differential series. Yes. There is a class of uh, series or generating functions that pops out naturally in circuitical physics and some innovative combinatorics problems. That's the ratio of definite guides or ratio of diagonal or fractional functions. Or uh, Because in first slide you mentioned the elementary operation, the sum of generating functions yeah. or product, but how about the ratio? The ratio of generating functions, it's difficult because you do, do want to make sure that you uh, have uh, still generating functions. So typically instead you would have the, the quasi inverse, right? Where instead of, um, it's not quite the same, but this is the close to division that I think you can get very easily is where you would take this. So that does not, that gains you, that doesn't gain you too much, but the, the, and that's very different from what you're suggesting. But I don't know how, you, how, what sort of combinatorial operator you would have to get that and to ensure that it actually gave you a generating function at the end. So, uh, what, pardon? This is, this is, sorry, so th this is fine. I mean, it's a sequence and this is division, so. No, no, I, I agree, but it's, I think it's, if you were only, if you wanted to, um, I think it wouldn't have all the, necessarily the same, that you wouldn't capture the ratio of, of all definite functions with just the quasi inverse. Would you? Oh, you just subtract one is what you're going to say. Mm, I'm not sure. <laughs> Many problems in circuitical physics where it's not a generating function, but that's a reciprocal of right. generating function that is definite, and uh, that's that's an interesting class. I, I think I I that sounds reasonable. Yeah, I don't have a good commentary understanding of that though. Another question. So I have one question. It's uh, early in your talk you mentioned the the dream of relating the angle 
uh, of the opening angle of a cone with the, pro the nature of the generating series. But uh, suppose uh, the, uh, the angle is not rational, or, mm -hmm. um, then it will be very difficult for, for a walk to, to arrive on a boundary yes. before crossing. So do you, there must be some arithmetic uh, property to be studied. So would you say, or do you know, are you aware of results that would, uh, that would analyze this uh, in relation to this, uh, to this, to this? The, the arithmetic property, no, but I would say that it, this definitely seems to be a blocking point. If you can jump over a boundary uh, in, in any regard, that definitely makes things worse. So what are you suggesting? Trying to say, can you find the generating functions from that property? Relay the nature of the, of the, of the series with the property. Well, I think in the, what, uh, the example would be, I think, from what Mireille was talking about, where you, with the long, longer steps, you can jump over it. So if you're very, very controlled, uh, then you might have a, a possibility in how you jump over it. Uh, the way I view it is that for large steps, the way Mireille did, uh, you, can, you can enumerate the, the a finite, finite amount of subseries that, 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 would, mm -hmm. that would cross. But if uh, the angle is not rational, then you can uh, never do I, that. I, don't, I, I cannot even write the, the kernel equation. Yeah, so if you want to play the, uh, this game, the very yeah. basic question is just to take walks with north and east yeah. steps below a line of irrational slope. And so that's the very first question to ask. Uh, and I'm not sure whether it is known that it is non-definite or whatever. Or what, what the structure would be. Uh, I, even, I, would just, I would hope that it is not. Even if the angle is a rational multiple of pi, where, which is where you would expect possibly definiteness due to the exponent. But I think this is the place to start. More questions or comments? No, so let's thank uh, Annie again. Thanks.